Coming up tonight, we're connecting you with stories about the intersection of art and politics, including artist Ama Ame's powerful examination of the January 6th insurrection attempt at the U.S. Capitol. I was interested in painting a picture of someone who stumbled into a pit really of her own making. What exactly is the role of art in this politically polarized world? We'll find out with political consultant Ryan McCullum. A political cartoon, when effective, will give the voter a different aspect that they might not have seen. To make it absurd or to make it ridiculous allows your mind to maybe look at that issue in a different way. And Berkshire's-based artist Pops Peterson shares his passion for art, social justice, and civil rights. Norman Rockwell himself had been forbidden to do any main characters who were not white. So I just redid this thing with a whole different cast and the civil rights community just basically drafted me because they said, wow, this is really important work you're doing. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture, and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Today marks the one-year anniversary of the attempted insurrection at the United States Capitol, and we're marking this somber occasion by taking a look at the role of art in politics this evening. Local artist and Westfield State University professor Ama Ame is set to debut a new project entitled In His Name at Pope Gallery in Holyoke on January 15th. The exhibit, which focuses on the January 6th insurrection attempt at the U.S. Capitol, has been a work in progress for several months now. Connecting Point visited him this past summer during the early stages of the project, and we rejoined Ame in his Holyoke-based studio recently to learn more about both the completed exhibition and the inspiration behind it. January 6th in many ways represents the American story in so many ways. And so as I've been developing the drawings, uh, I have been doing a lot of writing on the side and um, taking a lot of notes and realizing that the story is so much greater than any one day. And so that has informed uh, the, the, the works themselves. It's informed the direction um, that I've wanted to take with some of the pieces. Um, and as the works are still in progress, they're still in development, uh, it's in many ways informed how I'll bring them to an end. As I was walking around, I noticed that many of the pieces are black and white, but there is one piece that does incorporate some color and yeah. some interesting materials. So talk to me about the decision to incorporate color in one of these and the material that you used. The one that currently has color is titled, And I'll Be There With You. And that is a work that features a female um, in the center of the canvas who is laid out in a pose as if she's being carried. And that female represents um, the woman who was shot at the Capitol. Her name is Ashley Babbitt. She is in many ways a tragic figure. And that piece has color for a very specific reason. Uh, she represents really America's every man or every woman, right? But she, she's a veteran. <laughs> I mean, let's start there, right? She's a veteran who in many ways became the definition of, I don't want to say a, a traitor or, a tr or, or someone who does treason, but, but someone who wanted to overthrow her own government. And so her story is fascinating in how she was killed. I was interested in painting a picture of someone who stumbled into a pit really of her own making, um, but is now being held up not by anyone's arms, but by the very stakes that the flags that cover her were meant to carry. The flag motifs that are around her body are her covering. These are the things that in some ways, the ideals that in, in some ways that she carried, the things that she believed, but the title of the work also tells you a ton about what you need to know about this image. The title, and I'll be there with you, um, sounds biblical, but it's 
it's right out of the transcript of what Donald Trump said before she rushed to Capitol and was killed. And he wasn't there. He wasn't there. She died alone. And so her figure is taken from uh, a work by Michelangelo titled Pieta, where the form of Jesus is being held um, by the Virgin Mary after he's been crucified. I've replaced her body with that of Jesus because in some minds, she really has become a martyr. Um, but in many minds, in my own included, she's just a really, really, really tragic figure. This exhibit will also include um, the musical composition of Hanif Nelson. Why did you want to include music as part of this exhibit? How do the two artistic mediums collaborate to tell this story of In His Name? For me, the story is so much bigger than just a visual expression. The story is musical. It is textual. Um, the idea of marrying image with caption the idea of marrying image with melody to tell a fuller, broader, and more accurate story is something that I've wanted to do for years. When we last spoke to you, you stated that you refuse to separate yourself from this story and you're unapologetic about it. What conversations and, and do you hope people have when they are engaging with this exhibit? The, okay, so the good professorial answer would be, I hope that this sparks a conversation about race, and I don't know if I believe that anymore. I am very, very, very satisfied with these ideas, as uncomfortable as they are, and as honest as they are, and as raw as they are, and as unedited as they are, it's the other thing about these images I'm working on, they're not edited. They're black and white on canvas. I'm not doing a lot of erasing. They're, they're there. I am okay with these images and accompanying text and accompanying musical scores, sitting and making people think and maybe even causing some discomfort. I am okay if that's all that happens for now. And if more comes from that, then that responsibility should be on all of us, the artists and the viewers, right? Um, the, 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 the performers and the audience, somehow working together um, to push this nation into a new place. That is something we do together. There's no one person or group of people that can do that. Every Thursday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. In this week's digital exclusive, artist and educator Ama Ame, who we just profiled, discusses his work entitled, And I'll Be There With You, which explores the death of Ashley Babbitt, who was shot and killed by a Capitol Police officer during the January 6th insurrection. She's a human being, and I'm trying to be careful um, about how to depict her. Um, so in this case here, I had a number of ideas. Do I, do I make her, do I put her in this position, but no one's holding her, but maybe the, the various flags that were there that day are the ones holding her body up? You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. Berkshire's bass artist Maurice Pops Peterson is also a public speaker on the arts and civil rights. His solo exhibition, Rockwell Revisited, is the longest running show of its kind at the Norman Rockwell Museum with a permanent virtual version on display on the museum's website. And his most recent work includes a reimagining of Rockwell's Ruby Bridges entitled Walk With Her, which is a mural above Center Street in Pittsfield. Producer Dave Frazier visited with Peterson recently to discuss his work and his passion for civil rights and social justice. Norman Rockwell's Four Freedom Series toured the United States in 2018 in celebration of its 75th anniversary. But it is the interpretation of these classic images by Berkshire artist Pops Peterson that has perhaps given Mr. Rockwell's work renewed life. And I thought it would be really cool to walk around Stockbridge where Norman Rockwell did his pictures and found his models and just redo what he did 
as if it was happening now. I thought it would be really cool, and maybe at the museum they might like it. I might be able to have a little show in a basement room or something one day and have my friends over. It would just be fun. Peterson's work, entitled Reinventing Rockwell, emulates the iconic illustrator's style while tackling contemporary issues of diversity, social justice, and what it means to be an American. People of color had been always left out of the American landscape. We'd always been kept out of that picture. Norman Rockwell himself had been forbidden to do any main characters who were not white. So I just redid his thing with a whole different cast and I, with the civil rights community just basically drafted me because they said, wow, this is really important work you're doing. Using photography and digital technology, Peterson reinterprets the placid bedtime ritual of a white family in freedom from fear to freedom from what? making it a black family with dad looking anxiously over his shoulder at what may be happening outside his window. Another adaptation was Thanksgiving Gay Dinner, a gleeful take on freedom from want. In Peterson's version, the holiday meal is hosted by an interracial same-sex couple, which happens to be himself and his husband, Mark Johnson. Inspired by Rockwell's 1943 Freedom of Speech, Peterson says his work represents those who have been marginalized and have fought for inclusion in the political process. Freedom to worship was reimagined to include and respect all faiths and non-faith traditions and also reflect the diversity of the Berkshire region's residents. It was teaching people, you know, what it's like to be on the other side. It's, it's been the most unexpected and the most gratifying thing that's really ever happened to me. Rockwell's highly recognized image of the civil rights movement, The Problem We All Live With, features six-year-old Ruby Bridges on her way to an all-white New Orleans public school in 1960. Just recently, Peterson transformed Ruby into a 28-foot-high mural above Center Street in downtown Pittsfield in recognition of the Jubilee Hill neighborhood. It uses Ruby Bridges' image by Norman Rockwell, reimagined as Rainbow Ruby, so she includes everybody now. So all kinds of people in color, immigrants, gay people, trans people, all are represented in Ruby. It's um, in this location because back in the 70s, this is a whole different urban landscape and it was changed for an urban renewal project and everybody who lived here had to move. They were all kicked out and she represents anybody who's gone through some adversity, who have had to endure hardships but it, it just represents that you need to walk on. Although Pops Peterson never planned to be involved in civil rights work, his reinventing Rockwell series and other works around the Berkshires have given him the opportunity to share what life was like for him and what his hopes are for the future. I'm somebody who's come from a very dark place, being black and by being gay and feeling that the world was just angled against them, you know, and that you would never really, really be free, that you'd never be happy, that you'd never have a love of your own or a world where you could just be proud and walk down the street. And if you want to see more of artist and civil rights activist Pops Peterson and his powerful work, then head on over right now to nepm.org slash connecting point for a digital extra featuring the artist that you won't see anywhere else. So here's one of the Roundstone Barn of Hancock Shaker Village descending from the sky as a UFO. And here's the Anthonium floating away like a hot air balloon because of all the nonsense being discussed inside. This is my favorite. This is Godzilla terrorizing North Street. Be sure to catch this digital extra and so much more available online right now. Art and politics have long had a complex relationship. From late show monologues to editorial cartoons, politics has long been a muse for creativity and commentary, and politicians have used art as a tool to engage and connect with voters as seen in the many battles over the use of popular music and political campaigns. And the complexity of that relationship has only intensified as political divisions have grown. So, in this politically polarized and media-saturated world, what lies ahead at the intersection of art and politics? I spoke with political consultant Ryan McCullum to find out. From the beginning of, of politics, from the beginning of democracy, art has had an impact on, on politics because 
both art and politics are, are very broad subjects. They they have to have the, uh, an impact on one another. And so um, whether it's whether it's music or um, poetry or the fine arts, like we talk about when we talk about paintings and drawings and sculptures, but also in campaign art, right? So propaganda, for lack of better words, um, needs to be appealing to make your case. And so when you're working on a political campaign, the logo, the lawn sign, everything that is part of your campaign should be aesthetically pleasing, right? And, th and that takes artists. The art world tends to lean more towards the liberal side of politics. Why do you think this is the case and why don't we see more conservative art and artists? You know, historically, it seems like that in America. Um, I think maybe because you know, you can't, you also can't divorce politics and social movements. Um, and our social movements in America have tend to be more progressive and to be more liberal, whether it's the civil rights era or the protest generation during the Vietnam War. But that's not to say there's not conservative artists, right? There's not, there's plenty of conservative artists. There's plenty of, especially coming out of the faith community, right? So, you know, nowadays, if you look at the country, the country music um, genre, they tend to be more conservative and they might not be outright saying, you know, I'm a Trump guy, but they, they, they say things that are more conservative about standing up for the national anthem and protecting their Second Amendment rights. So there's not a lack of it. I just think that just through organic, you know, just through time in America, that social change piece and politics are so interwoven um, that, you know, uh, artists tend to be a bit more liberal. Switching gears just a little bit, throughout presidential elections, we have seen the clash between arts and politics. The first major collision, according to Rolling Stone, was Bruce Springsteen objecting to Reagan's use of Born in the USA. And more recently, we saw Neil Young and Pharrell Williams stopping the Trump campaign from using their music. Should yeah. art be separated from politics or is the overlap necessary? I think the overlap is necessary, right? So. Um, because art and politics, again, like I said, are so, so, so deeply impactful on our lives and also just have no choice but to be interwoven. Um, but like I just said, artists are humans and they have their own principles as well. And so, um, you know, Pharrell or Neil Young not wanting um, President Trump or former President Trump to be using their music is it's their right. Um, it's their it's their work. Political cartoons is another art form that has been around for a really long time. According to Britannica.com, the first known American cartoon was published by Benjamin Franklin in his Pennsylvania Gazette um, in 1754. So does art that directly comments on or explores politics have any real influence over politicians or the voters? Definitely. Just like, just like satire and just like a, a, a monologue, a political cartoon when done when when effective will will give the voter a different aspect that they might not have seen to make it absurd or to make it ridiculous and to put it into a cartoon format um, allows your mind to maybe look at that issue in a different way the politics of now can be viewed very different differently with the passage of time um what role if any does art have on how history looks at notable political moments i think it's very interesting the um one of the best pieces of pieces of art now, in my opinion, is there's a Robert E. Lee statue that has been transformed with graffiti and different pieces of art all over the statue and projection on the statue as almost taking that old piece of art and making it new in politics of now to protest black, you know, to say Black Lives Matter. And so that piece of art, right, using that medium of a of a civil war general who wanted to keep black people enslaved to now say black lives matter is very interesting in this politically polarized world um, saturated with media what lies ahead um, for the intersection of art and politics people are consuming art much more differently in their homes on their phones on their computers right and so um, i think that's going to continue to be the case i think as politics have changed over the hundreds of years, so has art changed for over hundreds of years, but they've always been hand in hand. So I think as our politics change and, you know, we are polarized um, to a degree, I think I would I would posit that we've, we've been pretty polarized 
in the past as well. Um, and it's always when you're when you're in the now, you always say, oh, it's never been this bad, right? But like, you know, there, it was pretty bad. My grandfather couldn't drink from a certain water fountain, right? Like that's that's pretty polarizing, right? Um, and so it does feel very polarized nowadays. But we've always kind of had that, and that and that is the um, that's what makes America kind of great, right? It's the it's you know um or democracy great i know churchill said democracy is the worst form of government besides every other form of government right so it's 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 bad it seems bad but everything else is worse um and so you know as politics change and as we're polarized art is going to be the same way And if you want to know more about how politics is viewed through the lens of an artist, then log on to our webpage at nepm.org slash connecting point for a digital extra as acclaimed editorial cartoonist Chan Lo, whose work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times and the Berkshire Eagle, shares his thoughts on the art of crafting opinion cartoons. Sometimes you go for the punch, you go for the, the kick in the head. Whereas with editorials, you sometimes want to back into a topic and get people to, to see it your way through persuasion. Don't miss this digital extra online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. The Center for New Americans has been a community-based education and resource center for immigrants and refugees in Western Massachusetts for close to 30 years. And for more than a decade, the organization has mixed business and artistic expression by holding a fundraiser called 30 Poems in November, where people write, read, and raise money to support the center's free classes and services. Producer Dave Frazier brings us more about both the events and the work that CNA does. I want to know how the sunrise speaks and the full moon turns your head. One by one, to participants took to the podium to share their literary work. 30 Poems in November was launched in 2008 as an annual fundraiser for the Center for New Americans. Both experienced and novice writers participated, each crafting a poem a day throughout the month. It's an incredible concept that people contact people they know and say, would you support me? Would you sponsor me? I'm going to do this. You know, instead of running a race, I'm going to write a poem a day. Would you give me X number of dollars per poem? I want to say thank you for these poems, for the promise to write every day. The event was held last November at the Center for the Arts in Northampton. Readers gathered in person while others joined by Zoom to share their poems. Christine Maribel, who immigrated to this country from the Dominican Republic when she was younger, was one of the participants who shared her poem. I had a hard time deciding which poem I was going to read, um, and I actually read a few to uh, one of my friends just to hear myself and to get her opinion, and I finally chose on one that I think fits for the Center for New Americans because the title is Belong. I am a mere speck, but I too have my place in this universe. I too belong. Sarah Sullivan has been the event chair for several years. Throughout the month of November, she organized workshops and offered online support to help inspire and motivate participants to fulfill their pledge of a poem a day. I had never seen where the Center for New Americans was my first two years writing until I had to come drop off a check or something. So I wanted the workshop to be here in person. And it was amazing, the gathering we had, the talent that you hear when you're there from from youngsters and old relics, or, uh, it's, it's incredible. Amherst Middle School student Maribel Hidago shared a poem about her experience leaving her native land of El Salvador and coming to America for the first time. My mama, my tia, my abuelita, and abuelito are crying as we give each other the last hug. I'm happy because I think I'm going on a field trip. The new places that I've never seen seemed so beautiful. When night came and I saw we were not going home, I began to panic. But I knew that as long as me and my mom were together, we would be okay. One well, I just kind of wanted to share my story and what was going through my mind when we moved here. 
because I was pretty small, so I was pretty confused on the whole situation. Yeah. Can you spell washing? Washing. With the funds raised, the Center for New Americans can continue with its mission to provide underserved immigrant refugees and migrant communities of this region with educational resources to learn English, become involved community members, and obtain tools necessary to maintain economic independence and stability. We'll see people who start speaking five words of English and will, over the course of several years, watch them, you know, achieve their their goals, their, their version of the American dream, whatever that is, one step Writing. at a time. Reading. Reading. Reading, yeah. Reading. So they are And even though the 30 Poems in November event has passed, we can still give you a front row seat to the reading of Carol Friedman's poem, Looking for Humanity. Just log on to our webpage for the digital extra. And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again every Thursday and Saturday at 7.30 right here on New England Public Media for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a good night. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers,